about it. Okay. Well. Viewing Eileen Eckstein's screen. View options. Okay. Okay, I just okay. Uh, my background is a control room from a gigantic factory in Rendsburg, Germany, and they converted the factory into a gallery space. Oh, it was humongous, <laughs> and they kept they kept the actual control room. Um, as a sort of artwork piece, um, and and I just thought it's really appropriate. Because speaker. I'm in the control room, so okay. So we are ready. We are ready to get moving, and um, Adam is going to turn the um, space over to uh, George Taylor. And I cannot wait to see um, incredible pictures. So we're ready. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So yes. um, should I start or do you, do you have any introductory remarks? With that, I'll go ahead and start then. Uh -huh. So we, we did a little bit about your background um, so that okay. people could read it ahead of time. <laughs> you were basically ready to start. Um, okay. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a, a real privilege to be here and to, uh, to share my, my images here. What I'm going to be doing is talking about using infrared photography for landscapes. And um, the, the topics that I'm going to be covering are a little bit of what infrared photography really is, a very short history of, of infrared methods, not to bore anybody. And then I'll show a number of landscapes in infrared and then talk a little bit at the end about what got me interested in infrared photography I've been doing for over 35 years. So to start, let's talk about what infrared is. The um, light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum that ranges from very high frequency rays, the gamma rays, X-rays, to all the way down to very long waves that are radio waves. The spectrum that we can see as humans in visible light is really very narrow. Um, and there is um, in ultraviolet light, which has a, a higher frequency. Although we can't see it, there are a number of animals that can. Butterflies, bees, salmon, and reindeer uh, can see in, in the ultraviolet spectrum. Infrared is um, towards the red spectrum, it's uh, longer wavelengths. And although we can't see it, also other uh, animals like snakes, mosquitoes, frogs, and salmon can switch their infrared vision on and off. The spectrum that we're gonna be talking about here is the near infrared spectrum uh, between where the, the wavelengths are between 540 nanometers to 900 nanometers. Um, in the um, deep infrared, the, uh, the far infrared is really night vision and thermal uh, imaging, and that's really a whole different kettle of fish. So we're going to be talking about the, the spectrum that's just below the visible spectrum here. 
Um, infrared uh, film really started in 1910, where um, the first black and white film image was published. And by 1933, there were 37 types of infrared film. And this is one of my early images in 1990 with black and white extended range infrared um, uh, film. And what I did was to paint the developer in the, um, in the dark room to sort of have this uh, irregular and jagged edges here. And this is a picture of the Judean desert. Now, infrared film is extremely light sensitive. So loading and unloading film has to be done in absolute darkness. You can't use a, a safe light at all. And otherwise the film fogs. And even uh, when you try very hard not to fog, this is an example of the fogging that you see here. These are the Smithsonian steps with fogging of the first image on the, the first negative on the uh, film. And I, I used it, I put it to creative use, but it was really, really a very difficult uh, film to use. Now, uh, infrared film is hard to find. Uh, there's only three manufacturers that make it, and it's difficult to find labs that will process it. Now, um, there was for a time, uh, Kodak made the aerochrome slide film that um, in the 1940s, and it had this very weird color spectrum. It was um, just really um, awkward to use, uh, but it really gave you some kind of interesting um, images uh, if you were careful with it and under special lighting circumstances. There are still some of these rolls of expired film available, and you can see the images on the internet from time to time. Um, as we move on to digital, I have to explain a little bit about how a digital camera works. The sensor is a, um, a light sensor that's uh, sensitive to visible light as well as infrared and ultraviolet light. Uh, there, when the, the camera is manufactured, there's a special um, infrared light blocker that's put in front of the sensor so that uh, it prevents the uh, too much infrared light coming in. And they do that because infrared light has a different focal point. And um, if you let it come in, you get an image like this. This is was taken in with a, a full spectrum camera without that infrared light blocker. And you can see that there's a red shift to the camera and uh, some of the, the image may be out of focus because there's both visible light, infrared and ultraviolet light. Um, but it can also be very interesting um, when you use a full spectrum camera uh, with artificial lighting because each of the light bulbs emits a different frequency of light. So you get green light here, you get some red light, some orange light, all because the light bulbs are different and you're not blocking any of the light with these full spectrum cameras. Um, this is ultraviolet photography, just so you, that you know what it looks like. Um, it's used, it's, um, you take a full spectrum camera and put a different filter on it, a different lens that doesn't absorb ultraviolet light. And it's primarily used for medical situations and, uh, and forensic. So that's the other end of the spectrum. In order to do infrared photography, you have to take that infrared blocker out of the, the, um, the camera. You have to modify the camera and it's done in a permanent basis. So you send it away, they take away this infrared filter, and then they place a, a red filter in front of it. And you can specify what range of infrared um, radiation you want it to, to let through. So what this does is that it tends, this filter tends to absorb all of the, the wavelengths except for the infrared spectrum. It does let through visible light, but it preferentially uh, lets you see 
ultraviolet, I mean, infrared light. And so um, what you see is um, um, a, an image that looks pretty terrible. And I'll, I'll show you the process here. So um, this is a, uh, an image um, in the desert in central, in the Central Valley of California. It's a, it's a, a digital uh, color image. There's nothing particularly interesting about it. Uh, I shot the same image with uh, an infrared camera. And this is how it comes out of the camera. It's all red. And yeah. you see a, a slight difference in color between the foliage here and the rest of it. But there's very little contrast. And it's, um, it's kind of a disappointing image when you first see it. So that's when you have to bring it into Lightroom or, um, or a bridge and start manipulating the image. What, what you first have to do is to change the white balance of the image, which is a way of um, removing um, unwanted color casts. And it helps you um, look at, make an image that looks much more pleasing. Now, because infrared film is all false colors, there isn't necessarily a, a you're not going to make it look like a normal color image, but you can make it look uh, a little bit different. And the goal of all of this manipulation is to start separating tones. So now comparing the, the image that we got straight out of the camera, as you change the white balance, you start seeing a separation of tones. The, the foliage looks a little bluer, uh, everything else looks um, greenish, yellow, it's getting there, but it's not particularly a pleasing image yet. So then we um, end up using the, uh, the channel mixer to change um, the, um, the way the, um, the colors are represented. And uh, very quickly, what you do is you take the red fill, the red channel, put it all to blue and all of the other, the red and the green channels don't exhibit any, any color at all. Then you take the blue channel and you allow all of the red um, to appear and none of the rest. So then um, there is a lot of information on the net on how to process these images early on. But the result of it is that you start getting a better separation. So from some separation of color to now you start seeing um, a little bit more of a pleasing image that the, uh, the sky is blue, the foliage is orange. You can make the sky orange and the foliage blue, whatever you wanna do. And then you can change it to black and white as well. So there are a number of ways of processing the image. Now, as I show you this image here, you might say, well, this is just a regular black and white image. What's different about it? This is a regular black and white image. So if you notice, there's very little contrast between the foliage and the background, between the sky and the mountains. In the, the infrared, you start seeing a much, much better separation uh, between the dark sky and the clouds. They really pop. Separation between the mountains and the, um, the foliage. And it's a very different uh, looking image. And so you, you can use it to explore the landscape in a slightly different way so that it's not just black and white or color. You have a different palette to, to work with. So with that, what I wanted to do is to start showing you some um, infrared landscapes uh, with the idea that infrared is not just white um, foliage. It's really using the, um, the foliage, the sky, and the clouds as compositional elements to create a very different looking landscape. Uh, many times these things appear as mystical or ethereal, sometimes even spiritual images um, that are very, um, they're unique. 
And you never know what you're going to get when you start because infrared, um, the spectrum is modified by how much sun you have, how dark it is, um, or how, how hot it is, whether it's spring, summer, or fall. So all of these externalities really cause you to, to have a different outcome whenever you go shoot. Now, with every, just like any other landscape, an infrared landscape has to start as a good image uh, to begin with. You're not going to fix a terribly composed or an uninteresting object uh, just by shooting it in infrared. So we're gonna start close to home for us. Uh, we split our time between Philadelphia and Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And so this is an abandoned shack at the Woods Hole Yacht Club in, uh, in Falmouth. And you can see that um, the, the, um, the shed is being taken over by the foliage. It's just being consumed by all of these plants. And the plants start mimicking or echoing uh, all of the white clouds that are around it. Here, this is the, the agricultural fair at Martha's Vineyard. And infrared sometimes makes the, 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 the place look like it's abandoned or it's, there's something not quite right here. The people don't look right. The, um, it looks like something is going to happen. It's not normal. And that often gives you a very different feel for, for a place that you're, you're photographing. Um, this is Uncle Tim's Bridge, which is a, a very old bridge that goes from the town of Wellfleet to a small island uh, across Duck Creek. And you can see how infrared really works very well with, um, with reflections in how you get uh, this dramatic looking foliage and the contrast between the foliage and the, uh, the sky really pops um, with these leading lines of the, the bridge leading to the center of the image. Now I'm showing you three images of the same area done at different times of the year and at different times of the day. And you can see how it looks quite different. Um, this is also at high tide uh, in Duck Creek and Wellfleet looking um, at a different angle. And uh, now the, the sky is uh, lighter blue, the foliage is more orange, and you get these beautiful reflections of the, the trees uh, on, the, on the, the creek there, is, um, there are all of these subtle colors of the, um, that come out of the, the, the marsh grass. Um, another image taken from this vantage point uh, shows you how different it looks in black and white. Again, with, um, with a black and white regular um, visible spectrum uh, image, all of the foliage would look like these grasses here. There would be darkish, muddy brown. And so there would be very little separation between the sky, the foliage, and the reflections. And so it really allows you to, to create this image that uh, using uh, reflections that you can't in, in, in any other medium. And as the tide goes out in Wellfleet, you start seeing the skeletons that are buried underwater. This is uh, about 100, mile, 100 yards away, showing the remains of an old boat that was um, marooned there during an old, um, a, um, a hurricane many years ago. And it, it leaves you with this, this uneasy feeling about what caused this thing to happen, what caused the, uh, the wreck, what's beyond the, the foliage. It's, um, it's an unusual looking palette that you can get. This is the Charles River in South Natick, 
close to where uh, I used to live when we were in Boston. And again, just the, the, the beautiful mirror-like reflections of the foliage that you can get on the water are really uh, stunning. This is an image of the skyline in Provincetown, which is at the, the tip of Cape Cod. And Provincetown is in the summer, a, a, a wild place, there are tons of tourists, tons of artists and a, a very, um, very happy place, let's say. And the, um, to, to see or to find an image that's peaceful in Provincetown, sometimes is really hard to do. And um, what I liked about this image was that the, the fluffy clouds were really uh, repeated in these fluffy um, looking um, leaves uh, on, the, on the leaves below, on the trees below. This is not necessarily an outside landscape. It's really uh, peeling away the outside landscape, looking in to the boathouse at Wellesley College. And I put the camera directly on the window pane and you can see some of the reflections of the outside, um, allowing us to have both the outside in infrared and looking into the, uh, to this a little bit of a holy place where nobody is allowed except for during competitions. Anasquam is in Cape um, Ann, just north of Boston, and it is the beginning of the craggy, uh, rocky coast that extends all the way up to Maine, and it's one of my favorite places to, uh, to visit as well. It's a very different uh, landscape than Cape Cod, which has primarily dunes and, um, and sand. Moving on uh, away from uh, the Cape, uh, infrared is really a, a wonderful way of exploring public art as well, because you have features that are both, um, they're, they're recognizable, they're well known, you, you've been here, you've seen this before, but it's depicted in a very different way. And Many times the, the, the reflections that you have uh, in infrared can really give you a, a very different feel. This is, these are the pyramids, which are, it's essentially a, uh, a light source for an underground gallery at the National Gallery in, uh, in DC. And I went below that and shot the waterfall um, in the National Gallery. And the, um, the fact that this is slow film and the fact that it's grainy and that it, it reacts very differently to bright light versus uh, subdued light gave me this really interesting combination of light and dark that I, I really enjoyed. It's also um, a, a wonderful way of being able to explore uh, sculptural elements and um, in public art. Uh, this was during a walk uh, through the National Gallery Sculpture Garden outside. And um, it's part of the, uh, the, the, the mall in DC. And here, if you had a, a black and white image in the visible spectrum, the, the darkness of the sculpture couldn't be separated from the dark green of the, um, of the foliage. And so shooting it in infrared really allowed me to separate that, the, th the three-dimensional aspect of this um, statue away from the background in a very nice way. And sometimes um, the, um, the colors that you get, depending on what paint or what, um, what color spectrum is being reflected, you get some pretty unusual colors. Here, this was an, a, an outside art installation in the Smithsonian that gave me this brightly orange uh, looking house. And if you look 
the tulips are this subtle, color, subtle blue color that was totally different from what was present in reality. This uh, is now close to home here. It's the, the persistence mural in Fishtown. Uh, it was uh, painted by Jay Turner. And uh, I didn't colorize this image at all. What I did is that I processed it and then created a black and white layer and blended it using a darken mode. And so all of the, the areas that were blue became black and white and the other colors remained. So this is a, a way that, that the result is that you focus on the artwork and it's framed by this, this ethereal foliage that has no color and doesn't distract from the, uh, from the, the mural at all. This is a very large statue called uh, Confrontational Vulnerability by Seward Johnson. And it's in his atelier uh, just outside of Trenton. It's about an hour north of Philly. And if you haven't been there, I would really encourage you to visit it. Uh, the statues are huge and they're really interesting. They're all recreations of, of very well-known uh, pieces of art. Uh, this statue uh, is about three to four times life size, and it's on a little hill surrounded by all of this foliage. And um, I shot this with a, a lens baby, which is a specialized lens that blurs the periphery and only gives you a very um, razor sharp center of the image. And as you get away from the center, it blurs it in a way that's controllable by the, the photographer. And what I really liked about this image was the gradation of color from the, the storm clouds that were almost directly overhead to the lighter clouds, to the, the subtle colors of the, of the foliage uh, beneath the, the statue. It's also, um, I've used it to explore um, monuments and explore public buildings. And the best place to do this is in Washington, DC. There are so many um, public monuments. Uh, this is the Custis Lee Mansion in, um, at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, and it really uh, depicts it in, a, in a, an unusual way, I think. Many times um, when people are, are placed within the, uh, these infrared images, they, they look like they're somewhat ghostly or um, they don't look quite normal. But this to me um, was uh, almost like an alien set of tourists coming to visit our national capital and seeing the Washington Monument coming out of the, the mist in the background. This is the Washington Monument uh, with um, all of the flags at half staff. And uh, I have to admit that I cheated here. I colorized the, the American flags so that they were more recognizable as the, the standard color. Uh, the rest of the image was just processed like I had, uh, had shown before. This is the, the Caracol or the uh, observatory in Chichen Itza. Um, it's a, this is a, one of the, the many ancient civilizations that I've explored with, um, with infrared photography as well. Uh, the observatory is called that because it has a number of um, of uh, windows and doors that align with the path of Venus. And they call it the caracol or snail because of a spiral staircase that's in the center. And the fact that it's hot and humid really gives you a, a, a lot of, um, of infrared radiation. Now this was taken with film and the old infrared film didn't have a backing to it. Uh, and so, there was often some reflection 
from the back to the front of the film of the emulsion. And so it had this um, sort of glowy appearance that came with that, that, lens, that uh, film that's uh, a little hard to reproduce uh, with, um, with digital images. This is uh, Machu Picchu in Peru. Uh, Machu Picchu uh, is uh, in Quechua means the old pyramid, Machu old uh, Picchu pyramid. And it was the 15th century estate for the, the Inca emperor Pachacutec. And at its um, height, there were about 750 people that lived there. They, um, they supported the emperor, they raised crops, they raised animals, they, um, they defended this. It's way up in the, uh, in the mountains. And again, infrared really allows you to, to bring out uh, a little bit of the spiritual feel that you have when you're uh, in such an unusual place in the middle of uh, the mountains. Um, it's, it's really a magical place to, to visit. I've also, we, um, we had the opportunity to go to Easter Island and uh, bring the, uh, the infrared camera. And uh, I took a number of images of the Moais, which are these huge um, rock statues uh, that were carved out of the, uh, a hillside quarry and um, brought at least a mile or two to their, um, their final resting place. They were made in between the 13th and the 16th century by the Rapa Nui people. And they were um, representations of their ancestors, but they were also a, a symbol of power and of wealth. And most of the, uh, the, the statues were placed on platforms called ahus. All, almost, well, all of them um, face inward, uh, facing towards the villages, except this one, the ahu akivi, which uh, faces out to sea. And uh, the, the mythology says that uh, they were placed this way to help the travelers find this uh, island 4,000 miles away from its nearest uh, landmass so that people could see these um, statues and navigate towards the island. They were carved um, out of a quarry called Rano Raraku. And this is on a low mountain or a big hill. And you can see how they carve them out of solid rock. Uh, these were never moved. They were, um, they were, when they were ready to be um, moved, they were cut out from the bottom there was a hole dug at the base and they were lifted with rocks. And then the, the myth was that they were walked down to the shoreline. But newer research says that these things were actually placed on rollers and rolled to their eventual location. But many of them never uh, moved very far from um, where they were, they were carved. And while they were called uh, the heads of the Easter of Easter Island, these are partially buried, so you only see the head. But um, below ground, there is a much much larger statue. These things weigh between forty and eighty tons, and they're massive. Um, unfortunately, most of, or many of them were toppled um, by the time uh, the. Um, the English and the Spanish came to the island. And it's unclear what happened. They, um, they think that a lot of earthquakes were responsible for the, the toppling, but there was also um, evidence that the Rapa Nui themselves toppled them and broke them um, for um, religious reasons it's, uh, themselves. Um, I've taken it to the Middle East and explored um, um, the, that area um, over the last several years. 
This is um, in Jordan. It's uh, a, an old trading city called Jarash. It's in Northern uh, Jordan and it was established 3,200 years before the current era. Um, and it was this huge nexus for travelers uh, bringing uh, commerce from the Silk Road from the, the East. And um, this is all that's left of this massive city where there were caravans of hundreds of camels bringing uh, goods through the city and trading and, uh, and then moving them on, on to Europe. Um, often all that's left are um, ruins with uh, very few of them being reconstructed. Close to there is also um, uh, Petra. And this is one of the few nighttime shots that I, I attempted with infrared. It's the, the treasury building, which is one of the, the biggest um, mausoleums that they have there. Uh, this was um, a, a special event where all of the lighting that you see here were candles in paper bags. Uh, and um, lighting up uh, the, the treasury. It's, um, and again, the, the red character of the stone is really not appreciated by the uh, infrared, but what you see is this glowy little mystical appearance of the rock and the, the, the contrast between the dark and the, uh, this mausoleum arising from the rock face. We, um, we also took it to, um, to Italy and one of the most interesting places um, uh, was Sicily where we did a, um, a week um, car tour that circumnavigated the, the island. Um, and um, this is Temple E in Selinunte, which is uh, in the Southwestern part of, um, of Sicily. Um, it was a temple to Hera, the, uh, the sister and wife of Zeus. Um, there is so much um, antiquity there and so many people have invaded Sicily that um, and all of them left a little bit of their mark there. And the Greeks were um, a culture that left a significant mark uh, in Sicily. Here's another view of the of Temple E. Again, really, uh, the sense that I got was that it was sort of fading into the mist of time because of the, the glowy nature of, uh, of the infrared film. This is in Taormina, although it's not a, um, a religious site, it was um, in the middle of, um, there were so many Roman ruins uh, throughout there that um, there was a, an amphitheater and the, the remains of a Roman aqueduct that um, really were, uh, were very special to see. Another very interesting uh, religious um, place to, to see is Angkor Wat, which is in Siam Reap in Cambodia. It's a Buddhist temple. It's a series of temples. And it's really the, the largest religious complex in the world. Um, made by the Khmer Empire in the 12th century, these temples are, um, it's interesting, it's both a Buddhist temple and a water management system because the Mekong River floods, floods backwards, and then empties out. Um, they, they in, even in the 12th century, they devised a way of storing the water in large ponds as part of the, the temple um, and releasing that water during dry periods. So here you, you see the, the temple and this mystic appearing um, forest behind it in infrared. This uh, Prasat Nyak Peon is both uh, a temple, 
but a, a, as well as a storage, uh, a water storage facility. And there are canals that uh, drain um, and fill these structures uh, with um, water from the Mekong, um, depending on the, um, on the, the time of year. Moving closer to home, um, religious monuments can be seen and they're, they're really very interesting even in the United States. This is a Sphinx uh, at Mount Auburn Cemetery just outside of Boston that was uh, donated to the cemetery in 1872 to commemorate the, uh, the Civil War uh, dead on the Union side. And again, it, it really appears as a, as a very different uh, feel to it uh, as compared to shooting it in black and white or, or color. Temples are huge and they can be quite, quite small as well and equally important. This um, temple in a, a beach in Ubud in Bali was about 10 feet square and yet it uh, was visited um, daily by, by many, many people leaving offerings and, um, and praying at uh, a small but very, very central temple. These are uh, steps um, going to Stations of the Cross at the um, Castel de Guadalest in Alicante, which is in Valencia in Spain. It's a mountaintop and at the top is a um, cathedral. And as you walk up the mountain, there are these uh, little uh, cement structures that um, where you, you can pause uh, during the uh, commemoration of the Stations of the Cross where um, it commemorates uh, the trials that Jesus had on this on his way to um, to being crucified, and um, it uh, it's really quite an unusual place to to walk. This is a very well known statue, the the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio, but very few images are done in infrared and. The contrast between the almost black sky and the Christ with his uh, hands extended is, um, I found it quite striking. Crucifixes also are such a, um, a staple in, um, in Catholic um, iconography. And uh, this one was in Chiaca in Sicily. It's a basilica with a, uh, a, a very large um, cement um, crucifix just outside of, of the, uh, the, the entrance to the basilica. And then uh, there are day-to-day uh, -day elements, day-to-day uh, -day structures that really um, resemble crosses or resemble um, religious um, symbols that um, you can find and, and, um, and show quite well with infrared. And then uh, I think what I've done is besides looking at monuments and religious uh, monuments and cities, uh, I've just used it to explore the world. So, um, these are the remainder of these images are really um, looking at um, travels through the eye of infrared photography. These are flooded trees in the middle of the Yangtze. Uh, they were planted uh, in rows, as you can see, but the, the, the repetitive nature of these was um, very calming in uh, the middle of this um, huge river. And then along the same river, you see the, 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 the fact that sometimes what we do as humans is beautiful, and sometimes what we do is just garbage. We leave garbage along the, the, the way um, for other people to either uh, see or clean up. 
This is a beach in uh, Kuta in Bali with um, these are cement um, um, blocks that are used to, to prevent erosion. And they formed a, um, an abstract composition uh, in the middle of this, um, this bright sunny day. I don't typically include a lot of people in, um, in the in infrared landscapes, but when you do, um, they, they really are create a, a, an interesting part of the landscape. These are um, uh, several women that are um, cutting down rice in the, in the fields outside of Ubud in, um, uh, in, the, in the island of Bali. At the same, um, in a very different part of the, of the world, this, we were on a small sailboat uh, on the Nile and we passed an island. Uh, it must have been maybe 50 yards by 25 yards. And in the middle of these reeds, hidden from everybody, was a fisherman uh, resting and uh, fixing his nets with uh, a cat um, standing guard. The, um, along the, the Nile, you can see the evidence of um, prior floods of the Nile, where um, it's now much more controlled, but in the past, the Nile would flood and create wonderfully fertile grounds, but it would also destroy um, the, um, the villages that were surrounding it. Uh, so that evidence is still around. The, you can still see it uh, as you go down the Nile. This um, is in a small village in Austria where I had the opportunity to, uh, to teach. And I, uh, when I looked at this shed um, with um, a sort of a black and white um, pre-composition, I thought I'm gonna take it, but I don't think it's gonna turn out very well. And it was early on in my, um, in my experimenting with infrared. And I was really surprised at how such a, a, a contrast between the boards and the, the grape leaves that, that came out. Uh, and it made me start really wanting to explore infrared more and more. Closer to home, um, it's really a, a wonderful way of, of creating a different take on the urban landscape here. This is a uh, scarecrow that is in the, uh, the community gardens at Liberty Lands in uh, Northern Liberties here in Philadelphia. And again, it's, it just makes it look quite strange and uh, different than you'd expect. Also not necessarily urban, but the debris of, um, of humanity. Uh, this is, um, in Haleakala, uh, way up on the mountain, um, on the way uh, towards Hana. And you see this beautiful landscape and a car that is being overgrown by weeds. Um, and one of the things that I find really interesting about infrared is that dead leaves don't glow. It's only the the foliage that's alive that gives you the glow that gives you a, a, a different color as well. Um, as the light changes and as you start going from just shooting in the bright glare of full sunshine, you start getting some very interesting effects. This was um, in the northern coast of Prince Edward Island uh, this September, huge storm clouds coming in about six o'clock at night. Um, the light is waning. The color that's being reflected from the grass and the sky starts changing and it gives you yet a different look at, um, at the landscape that is really not, um, it's, it's not predictable at all. 
I've been starting to experiment uh, a lot more recently with infrared photography in waning light in the dusk and in the dark. So you saw Uncle Tim's bridge uh, before in the middle of the day, harsh light. This is um, about 7.30 at night in uh, October where the sun is almost gone. And so, and it's a, a cloudy day. And again, you see it, it gives you a very different looking um, perspective on the, uh, on the landscape. It makes it look a little bit more foreboding and unusual. Um, this was during a snowstorm last year uh, on the Delaware. I, we live in a condo in Northern Liberties. Uh, this is looking over to the uh, Ben Franklin Bridge. And on a tripod, I process the same image two different ways. So I, what I was able to do was to show um, snowflakes both as white and blue and as orange. Uh, giving you this peppering of uh, snowflakes uh, in, the, in the landscape. The same night, I went into our parking lot and shot the uh, Rivers Casino, the lights in the Rivers Casino with um, the snow falling. And uh, again, giving you a, a quite unexpected look at a very familiar structure. So why do I do infrared? photography, why do I encourage you to, to look at it? It's, to me, it's interesting. It, it's different. What you um, get is completely unexpected, depending on the time of day, whether it's hot or whether it's cold, um, how much sun there is, the time of, of year. It's a little nerdy. You have to um, like the, the fact that you're going to spend some time with this photograph to make it something that you're proud of. It's not gonna be good straight out of the box. And it's a, it's a way of exploring creativity uh, a little bit differently. But the thing that, I, that really drives me to it is that it's um, in this time of COVID, it really is a way of identifying life. Um, it, whatever, um, reflects back to you um, really has life. It's uh, foliage, it's, it's a tree, it's a plant that's alive. And it's translated into survival for me, into spirit, into mystical and ethereal qualities. And so that's why I, I really uh, enjoy doing it. Um, that's the end of the, the talk. And what I would like to do is just to show you two more images um, in showing you that this is not the only invisible spectrum that you can use to, um, to create art. I've been shooting x-rays of flowers for many years. And this is another um, part of the, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum that you can use to create art. These are Green Bells of Ireland, the petals of Green Bells of Ireland. And this is a CT scan of a Nautilus. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and see if there are any um, questions, rotten tomatoes, um, severe criticism, whatever you, you want. So thank you very much for your thank attention. You. I, I cannot thank you enough. We have waited almost two years for this presentation. You were going to be giving it in person at the Plastic Club, and I cannot thank you enough for holding on to it and being willing to share it with us with this new Zoom method. It, it was beyond words. I, I, it's just, there, there was a thing when we had our meetings at the Plastic Club and we would have a presenter and the presenter would come in and they would give a presentation, not even as glorious as yours, not even, not even close. And a lot of people sitting there would say, that's it, I'm done. There is no way I'm gonna be a photographer. 
because I can't, they're, 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 this is beyond, you know, photography. And, and to me personally, that is the same feeling that I have just gotten from your presentation. It, it is beyond photography. It is amazing. It is wonderful. And I cannot begin to thank you enough for your support of the Photographic Society and, and for your giving your time to the people that, that were brave enough and courageous enough to continue with the Photo Society and to join a Zoom meeting. Boy, everyone has benefited beyond, beyond belief. So, George, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I, um, I have full disclosure, Eileen owes me money, so she has to say nice things about me. <laughs> so, but I, I really appreciate all of the, the lovely things you said. I mean, thank you very much. Can I ask Are there any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Hey, George, wonderful talk. You talk about infrared as illuminating life, and yet you continue to juxtapose man-made with nature. I didn't see many photographs without some man-made element to it. Do you purposely, or what's what's the what's the what's the creative rationale behind always having a human element juxtaposed with the natural? Oh, hi, Ray. Um, thanks for for coming. I think that's a it's a wonderful question. I think the the um, it's really more of a compositional um, um, decision because just landscape by itself, um, foliage by itself, isn't particularly interesting most of the time. And what I found is that when you place a man-made object in this, this scenery, it, it really sets it off. And so it's really using, um, using infrared to create um, the foliage as a compositional element. And at the same time, looking and when you see that, that image, you realize that there is life in the image, hmm. that there is both what we've brought to it and there is life around us that we can't control. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. <clears throat> You're muted. Um, I guess I have a question. Um, well, uh, a few questions. Um, let's see. Um, are you still using film for infrared or do you use primarily digital conversion now? Um, I use digital conversion um, almost it's exclusively. I haven't shot film in about 15 years. Um, I had a, um, a dark room at home that I processed, but it's just um, gotten harder and harder to find infrared film and to be able to find someone that will actually develop it and not fog it. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, if somebody wants to get a uh, camera converted to infrared, um, what you know about that and, and what might be the best way to do it and, and maybe some costs involved with that? So um, there are a number of places. Um, the, the most well-known is ColariVision, K-O-L-A-R-I Vision. Um, you can look them up on the web and they... Um, the, the process, if you have a camera that you want to, to, uh, to convert, uh, they will convert pretty much anything from a point and shoot camera to a high level SLR. And um, they, um, you send the camera in, it voids the warranty. So um, it's once you mess with the, the, the sensor, uh, it's the warranty is gone. So um, I've used um, an old camera I have an old Nikon uh, D800 that I, I converted. Um, and then if you go on the website, they also have cameras that they have bought, converted, and will sell to you. And the price range is, is um, there is a premium for the converted camera, but it's $100, $110. So if you're going to buy a point and shoot, you would expect to pay about the same price for that camera plus a hundred or so dollars um, 
for the conversion and the mailing to you. Can you, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, with your x-ray pictures that you showed at the end, was that, you said you used a CT scan, so that's not the same type of equipment. You, there's no x-ray camera, in other words. Is there? <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't sure. I just. I wanted to ask. No, you know, no. Um, there, there, um, there are portable X-ray machines that are the size of a small uh, refrigerator that are used for uh, specimen radiographs, for biopsies, and things like that. But um, um, it's it's not available for regular use. I um, the the reason I had access to it is that I'm. I'm a radiologist and I okay. um, had, I ran the radiology research lab. So I would go in early mornings and stay late and x-ray flowers, x-ray, all kinds of different things. But bringing in an x-ray unit to your apartment might make your neighbors a little crazy. I won't so. tell if you won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I yes, sir. George, George. Um, let's, let's do Anthony first and then Stephen. Okay. Hi, George. Thank you Hi. for that. It was wonderful. I, I have a question. You know, is it possible? And I, I think I know why it may not be possible. Maybe you can tell us. Is it possible to use um, some kind of filter on your lens rather than a conversion? You can get close. Um, people, there are uh, deep red filters that you can use that will make it look like um, close, but not, not really as good. Uh, the Ratten 84 filter is a, a very deep red filter so that when you, when you put it on, you really can't see anything. So the way to, that I've used it in the past is put the camera on a tripod, compose, then put this very dark filter on, shoot the, the image, and then see what I got. Um, and then um, there are photo filters that you can buy, um, you know, post-processing filters that mimic infrared. And they, depending on the image, they do okay or not so good. But it's so, certainly something to, to explore. Stephen. So I was just looking at the, whatever the name of the website you just mentioned, can't pronounce it, but. Um, Vision, yes. They, they, when you say the options, they have the different nano, nanometer ranges. Is there one you'd recommend to start with? Okay. So the, um, you can buy a number of filters that are deeper red to not so red, and they give you a very different looking image. Um, and the, but the, the image that you get is the image that you're going to, be getting from that point forward. So um, the, um, the filters that are not quite red give you an interesting looking picture, but you can't modify it very well in post-processing. So the one that I got was a seven, 720 nanometer filter, which is one of the deeper red filters. And then that allows me to do very nice black and white images with that white uh, looking foliage, dark sky, and it lets me play with the color when I, um, when I post-process it. So the 720 uh, nanometer filter, I, I chose because it's the, it's the widest, it, it gives you the, mo the most options in terms of post-processing. So that would be one that I, would, I might start with. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, it does I, I get have, a little nerdy. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question of just terrific. You know, one of these things that I'm, I enjoyed 20 times more than I thought I might. So thank you. Um, tell so me, you started with low expectations. Is that right? <laughs> so tell me about camera, you, you know, your exposure settings. Are they about the same as you would be using if you were, you know, using a traditional sensor and also could you comment on the lenses that you've been using uh in addition to the lens baby that you mentioned okay so all very good questions um the the lenses i use are the the standard lenses that i use for visible light photography 
Um, I take the, the UV filter off just because it, it, there is a little bit of infrared um, filtering that goes on. And because it's a dark red filter that's interposed between the lens and the, the sensor, it slows the camera down a little bit, probably by a stop. And so uh, I find that I have to, um, <clears throat> on a sunny day, um, instead of shooting at 100, I'll shoot at two or 400. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not enough to, to cause a problem most of the time. And it's really interesting that many times what I'll do when I'm going out is to do a test image um, in the environment. You know, how much sun is, is there? What's it going to look like? And often it actually overexposes. So things are really too bright. So I have to cut it down, um, either um, uh, drop the exposure by a stop, sometimes a stop and a half. So um, it takes a little bit of, of uh, um, you have to go out and say, all right, what's the situation? What environment am I in? Shoot an image and then either um, bring down the exposure or leave it as it is. Okay, thank you. All right. Great. No other questions? Um, I could ask another one. Um, sure. When you showed a few of your pictures, there were there was like a blue and orange component. Is that a natural part or is that just your chosen aesthetic for the post-processing or development of your pictures? It's primarily an aesthetic choice. Okay. And um, the, um, the two, the, there are three ways I generally post-process. Black and white, which mm -hmm. is fairly straightforward and either blue sky and yellow to reddish foliage or orange sky and uh, bluish foliage. And okay. you can do that by changing the channels. Uh, there are, once you get into this, um, if you, you look at um, um, ColeraVision and other websites have a lot of great content on how to post-process uh, infrared images. I'm a big Lightroom junkie and I always shoot raw. So I'm familiar with, there's there's so much more when you shoot, there's a difference between black and white and desaturation. And I love how you can choose that. So thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thank okay. you all of my friends who thank are, you, uh, who put I'm up sorry, with the looking. photography stuff. Okay. And now, there are 10 people who are super inspired. Here we go, here we go. 10 people who are super inspired by your presentation so that February 15th, we are going to see some of the most, um, not quite as amazing as yours, but pretty amazing work because we've got 10 really talented people who I hope were super inspired by your okay. presentation tonight. So we're looking forward to February 15th. Thank you so. for the reminder. <laughs> I appreciate it. I forgot. But you'll right. get it. You'll All get right. It. And Stephen. Thank Stephen you so much, everybody. Sent me directions, and I will be forwarding um, my ten my ten guys here um, the directions and. Then Stephen, Stephen has, Stephen volunteered. <laughs> I did. I volunteered. Stephen volunteered, and um, and he's going to make it go smoothly and incredibly great. So, but George, thank you, thank you, thank you, and and I'm doing that without being compensated. Thank you. <laughs> you always do. Thank you so much, Eileen. Thank All right. you. All right. Thank you, George. It, it, thank you, everyone. Um, I never expected that this, that switching into this Zoom presentation method, um, I had kind of mixed feelings about it, but considering that it's a way of sharing amazing photography at the same time, keeping everyone on a healthier scale. Um, again. 
I'm I'm grateful. I'm I'm grateful for the technology. So good night, sleep tight, pleasant, pleasant dreams. Good night. God bless us all, everyone. Yes, God bless. Good night. 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 Thank you.